Do you want to learn some property investment lessons from somebody who's been in the game for almost 50 years? You'd hope to get some great insights and perspectives, wouldn't you? Well, that's what you're going to get in today's show, but it's a little bit different to normal. As you know, I normally interview guests or have my little chats with you in this podcast, but I was recently interviewed by Pete Wardgent, a regular on the show, for his new podcast, Pete Wardgent's Property Pod. And you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that Pete asked some astute questions and got me to share some things I don't normally discuss, I don't think I've discussed in public before, including some more stories. Pete's a great interviewer, and I'm sure his audience got benefit from our chat, so I asked him for permission to run this particular episode of his show on the Michael Yardney podcast. And that's what we're going to do today, so welcome to today's show and enjoy. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Hey, welcome to the Pete Wardgen Property Podcast. I'm thrilled today to have a very special guest on the podcast. It's none other than Mr. Michael Yardney, Australia's number one property educator over recent decades, educating more property investors than anyone else in Australia, best-selling author, of course, and Australia's leading expert in the psychology of wealth creation. Michael, genuinely great to have you on. Thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure, Pete, and it's actually going to be fun being on the other side of the microphone and having you quiz me with the questions. I was just thinking the same thing. I'll be grilling you from the other side today rather than having questions fired at me. So it'll make a nice change, actually. So uh, Mm. let's back up the clock a little bit. Why don't we just go all the way back? I'd be interested to hear a little bit just about your childhood and background. So where, where did you grow up? Where did you live? And what did your parents do and things like that? Well, I came to Australia at the age of three. I was born in Israel. My parents were migrants and they were workers and they lived actually for the first eight years together with my grandparents, my parents, myself, and my grandparents even had borders in the house and some bungalows at the back just to get some cash flow. So we weren't well off at all. We were poor. And my parents eventually got their first home when I was eight. And then uh, my sister came along when I was the age of nine. We didn't have a car. I went to a local state school. I walked to school, but one used to do those things in those days. And I didn't really realize I was different or poor. I had nothing much to compare it with until I suddenly realized a lot of my parents' friends they had cars. They went on holidays. And later on in life, I found out they owned property, they owned investments, they owned their own business, not employees like my parents. And they were some of the early significant things that made me decide which way I wanted to head, Pete. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it's always a, it's interesting sort of to hear how people started out because you start to understand a bit more about their motivations and their journey. It's interesting because I came from a much more middle class background. My dad was quite successful in the public sector, but because there were seven of us in the family and only one income, I never really had much cash left over. But uh, I think the thing that really clocked for me, the first idea about property as an investment or an asset class, I can remember each time we traded up because my mum and dad moved around loads when I was growing up, went to about four different schools. And I remember them sort of saying, well, we've bought this house for £30,000 and sold it for sixty, dollars And the, the numbers always seem to go up. But they were also wildly disproportionate to the amount of income they seem to have left over each month. Um, so I was, we're just wondering, how did the idea of property investment ever come to you? Was it a book that you read? Was it a chance encounter? Was it people that you mixed with? How did it even come about? 
When I was in my middle teens, my parents moved house. And what happened was I was impressed by the real estate agents, Pete. They drove big cars. In those days, they were not the European BMWs and Mercedes and Audis. They were the American, what we used to call Yank Tanks. They were big and impressive, and they had fancy business cards. And I thought, hey, that's what I want to be. So while other people wanted to be, I don't know, astronauts or firemen, I thought I'd want to be an estate agent. I was impressed by that. I thought they owned the real estate. I didn't realise, of course, that it was the wealthy people they were working for that, that, that made them wealthy. So that was one area of uh, wanting to get into a career. The other was, as I said before, I realised my friend's parents, my parents' friends, w- w- were wealthy compared to us. And as they said, they went on holidays and then they had a different lifestyle. And I learned that they invested in real estate, which my parents didn't. I still remember, Pete, my father, every Saturday morning used to sit at the kitchen table, drinking his black coffee and smoking a cigarette and doing numbers on a bit of paper. And I asked him what he was doing. And he was working out what he was going to do with the winnings of his lottery ticket that came out every Saturday night. That was his financial plan. So I saw things at home and I saw the way other people did things. And I thought, no, no, I actually want to do it like my friend's parents were doing it. It's interesting. I mean, the, the National Lottery, where I was growing up in the United Kingdom, it was like a national obsession. But of course, you never really met or heard of anybody who actually won it. It was very much a, a dream, a speculative bet, but it wasn't much of a a financial plan for success. Um, It's a tax for people who can't do maths, Pete, because what happened was he would win little amounts, just enough to buy more lottery tickets, but never the big one. Yeah, absolutely. And um, often it's the people who've got the least um, to spend who put the most uh, money into those uh, lotteries. So uh, I'm going to, um, in the second part of today's interview, I'm going to talk a bit about your property journey because I want to hear about you know, how you got onto the ladder and you know where some of the investments that you've made over the years and what your portfolio looks like today and things like that. But you're um, very well known in Australia for being a top-selling author. So remember your book, How to Grow a Multi-Million Dollar Property Portfolio in Your Spare Time. That was an absolute classic and it's been reprinted no end of times. So it must be on its fifth or sixth edition or something at Wilkins and Publishing there. But uh, how, how did the idea, putting all of your experience and insights and lessons from property investment into one book, how did that idea come about? And did you expect it to sell as many copies as it has? Well, there weren't many books about Australian real estate. And I used to buy a few American books uh, and uh, they gave me some insights into what's going on. I'll share something with you that I don't think I've ever told anyone before because they've never asked. When I wrote that book was in my downtime in the early 90s when I was going through my divorce and I was in a bit of limbo and I really didn't have a lot to do with my life. So I spent a lot of time on my computer putting my thoughts together. That was in the middle 90s. Interestingly, it wasn't published Till 10 years later, I approached Michael Wilkinson, uh, my, my publisher, uh, publisher, after that, about t- 10 years later. So I started to accumulate a whole lot of thoughts, ideas. I had time to do it. And then I fine-tuned it. And I fine-tuned it six times. So some of the fundamentals, the basics don't change. But what's happened to the world and where we invest, and particularly finance and how that affects property has changed. So I never expected it to be selling hundreds of thousands of copies and on the shelf of almost every other successful property investor. But it was the beginning because I've since written nine books. And while that's very Australian-based, my one with Tom Corley that uh, uh, has now been translated into five languages, Negotiate Influence Persuades, been translated into a number of languages. So for somebody who didn't like reading, almost failed English at school uh, and never really read much as an adult in the way of books. I spend all my day writing nowadays. That is actually amazing. It would be great, wouldn't it, to go back and see your old English teacher and say, you'd never imagine that uh, I'd be a nine times published author and top selling uh, in the genre. And if you haven't read the book, by the way, um, do track down a copy. Um, Well, there's two there that Michael mentioned. Uh, how to Grow a Multi-Million Property Portfolio, which is um, a huge seller, but also uh, the book that you've uh, co-authored with the American Tom Corley. 
who's an excellent guy and very smart, uh, Rich Habits. So there's a couple of books for you to track down there. Um, you touched on an interesting point there, your divorce. So this is uh, or the asset reallocation program, as we euphemistically call it sometimes at your wealth retreat event. This, um, just on that point, I think you know, statistically these days, most of us will go through at least one de facto relationship, myself included. I know you're a leading expert in the psychology of wealth creation. Now, at your annual wealth retreat event, I know one of the exercises we do is we almost um, draw on a on a graph or a chart our progress through life and uh, your successes and failures. And one of the things you always see is that nobody has had a, a straight line success. There's always a dip somewhere in the middle. And some of us have bigger dips than others. I think I wrote in my first book about 10 years ago, I had a chronic uh, anxiety disorder that was quite debilitating for me. And as you mentioned, because of your divorce, the first time you built your property portfolio, you ended up losing some of it. A large part of it. Yeah. So I read in a book by Dr. Alexander Elder, who's a very famous share trader. And he said that failure is like a, a curable disease. You can almost analyze the causes of failure and prevent yourself from failing in the future. But I'm interested to know, why do we self-sabotage? Is it related to self-esteem? Because it's a pattern that seems to be repeated and repeated. Uh, So what is it that causes people to do that? I think it's to do with your wealth thermostat. In other words, we all have a particular level of success that we feel we deserve. And that's got to do with the programming you've had as a child, things you've heard, things you've seen, things you've experienced. And if you get above that level, and this is all subconscious, you actually sabotage and fail. I believe if you took all the money in the world and distributed it evenly, Pete, in, I don't know, five, 10 years time, it would be back into the same proportions again for exactly that reason. Uh, so yes, I self-sabotaged the first half of my life and I chased money for all the wrong reasons. Uh, because if you chased money because of anger or because you cross about your past or I had a difficult childhood, the money doesn't get rid of those sort of problems. So you've got to have a, a good reason for for doing it. So I also believe that failure is an important part of your journey. And the only way you get to the next level is by learning from your mistakes. So we employ close to 80 people in, or actually more than 80 now in our company, Metropole. And I actually like employing people who've had their own business, given it a go, it hasn't worked. And they've actually realized, hey, it's actually not as easy as all that. That's just part of the journey, Pete. One of the things I've always admired about your journey, which I guess I've been following for the best part of 20 years, you wouldn't remember this, but I came to see you, I think it was at uh, Sydney City Tats Club. This would have been around oh, well, it wow. been before before the financial crisis. I only did that one year, yes. Geez. Yes, you, yeah. you and Pam were speaking there, and you were like a celebrity, you know, when you turned up and it's like, there's Michael Yardney. And, but I think the thing that always struck me was that you've always had the confidence to look at long-term price trends and you never get distracted by short-term noise do you have a mechanism that um, allows you to do that because the more i read online these days everybody's focused on the next three months the next six months what's going to happen next year but you've always taken that bigger picture view i think well, I found that the average Australian thinks about what they're going to do this weekend. Most investors think about what's going to happen in two, three years' time. But the Decker millionaires, the very successful investors, business people, entrepreneurs, Pete, think 20, 30, 40 years down the track. And I think it all has a lot to do, again, with your headspace and your psychology. So when I went through my challenging times in the middle 90s and restarted my life again. And I I thought I did well because they couldn't take away the knowledge that I'd learned. They couldn't take away the knowledge about property investing, developing, that, that I started up all over again. But in fact, that wasn't true. It was actually the headspace, the psychology. Why are some people more successful than others? And I believe it has a lot to do with the way they think. And some of that's inherent, some of that's inborn as the old nature nurture thing, Pete. But I believe you can improve the way you behave, the way you think by the things you read, the things you put into your mind, the people you hang around, the mentors that you've got. That can make a difference. So you're Wealth thermostat, how wealthy you can become and how much you can keep is definitely not set, Peter. It definitely can be turned up. Yeah, actually, um, that's a really 
important point. And I think it took me a long time to realise this, but the old saying about you being the sum of the six people or half dozen mm. people you spend most of your time with, I, I think that is so true, isn't it? Because whether you realise it or not, the behaviours and um, the traits of the people that you hang around with, you tend to just mirror them naturally. We did it as kids. I remember my accent yeah. used to change depending on which school I went to. And, you know, and I think it goes on through life. You know, you start to mirror the behaviours of the people you spend time with. So you obviously should be spending time with inspirational and energising people, not people who just bring you problems and, you know, always uh, create a drain on your life. And uh, I think that's one of the things, actually, at the Wealth Retreat event, which um, you've run now at the Gold Coast for what uh, for many years. And I think I've been to about seven years of them. But it's even just turning up and spending a week in the presence of like-minded and positive people, it can only have a positive impact on you, I think. Very much so. So choose your friends wisely. So this is a, um, a question I always ask people on the podcast. Tell us about your first property that you bought. Was it hard to get on the ladder? Where did you buy? Uh, can you remember what price you paid? I do very much so. I bought the property at 17 Large Street, South Caulfield, and I went halves with my parents. I'd saved up some money. I worked. I did part-time jobs, and I saved $1,000, and they had $1,000, and we took a $16,000 loan and bought an $18,000 property. We took a $16,000 loan, 30-year mortgage, and had no idea how we were going to pay it off, Pete. And uh, I was lucky. We, we got $12 a week rent. If you look Back in those days, though, the average wage was about $100 a week. Uh, the, the family car was the Kingswood in those days. I don't know if you remember that. You went in Australia in those times. Uh, it was before the Commodore. That cost $2,000. So things were very different, and it was very expensive. It was difficult to get into the property market. But it was in the early 1970s when Gough Whitlam came into power, the Labor Party came in, inflation went rampant and, and the value of that property and the rents I got from it increased considerably. Interestingly, Pete, I still own that property. I sold it for my half share of my, for my back to my parents when I got married, half share of $32,000. Uh, Pam and I bought it back from my mother for two dollars to $60,000 in the early 90s. I've built two townhouses on it. So my first property that cost me $18,000 is worth about $2.5 million today in Large Street, South Caulfield. Still own it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do the numbers on the annual returns. But uh, I think <laughs> any, any way you look at it, that's that's pretty good. And obviously, mm. I talked uh, last week to Stephen Kukulis, and he was saying about the first place he bought in Canberra. Very similar stories in some ways in terms of the prices paid and so on. Um, I often um, look back and think, well, what would I have done differently if I, if I as you mentioned having the knowledge if I if I was starting out again today what would I do differently and you would think all these things I'd learn a trade I'd start a landscaping business I'd you know I probably wouldn't go to university I'd just get straight into investing and so on let's um flip that question around though if you were to advise a uh, youngsters starting out today do you think it's still a good idea to build a real estate portfolio and if so how would you go about it today rather than taking the hindsight bias and you know going back to the 1970s what would you do if you're a youngster starting out today well i suggest that you soon you get into the property market the better and we understand the compounding effect of leverage and time and owning the right asset uh, i'd actually teach them the importance of Delayed debt gratification, spending less than you earn, saving, investing, budgeting. Do what the government does. Take the money out before you spend it, like the government takes its uh, tax out of your salary before you get it, and do something with it. Now, it's much harder today, Pete, to save for the deposit because you, there's nothing much you can do. You don't earn much interest from it. But I think it's also important to become financially literate. That's not taught at schools. And sure, there's lots of books, there's lots of uh, podcasts and uh, webinars nowadays as well. But it's important to early in the piece, understand the financial, how the financial world works, how property works, how the economy works. And one of the other interesting lessons I would 
tell people, it would be very hard for them to learn at the moment is don't worry so much. Don't worry about all the things people tell you are going to go wrong because when you look back at it 20, 30, 40 years down the track, all those things that you thought may go wrong, may not work, they, they really weren't important in the long run. Yes, I mean, I think you could pick any year over the decades and somebody would, give, would be giving you some reasons why the world was going to end and we've been through no mm. end of crises over the decades, but real estate over the long term has always performed well. I remember mm. reading somewhere along the line that you got involved in some big commercial developments back in the day. So um, any war stories for us? Well, I was feeling very brave. One of the worst things that can happen to a property investor or any investor or business person is getting it right first time. You think you're smarter than you are. So in the 80s, I was involved in some very big commercial developments, a number of subdivisions in industrial, subdivision in in Bayswater, uh, where we bought an old farm, subdivided. I didn't even know about this stuff. I got a town planner to do the subdividing and engineering, and we had an agent sell off all these industrial lots off the plan in those days, and other investors got in and bought them, and uh, and I made a, a killing. But at the end of it, uh, we ended up with a recession in two thousand. Uh, sorry, the, the difficult times in uh, in the nineteen eighties before the the, the the recession, I should say. And uh, the people who ended up buying the properties ended up having a few more troubles. I, I actually had a couple of business partners who bankrolled us and. I made some very brave decisions and I got caught out in the downturn of the early 90s. I went into that time with quite a low loan to value ratio, about 70% loan to value ratio, a lot of commercial properties. And the value of those properties dropped considerably. I'd never experienced that when interest rates went up. So I lost all my equity and the bank said, sell. Uh, and I said, who too? No one was buying commercial properties. Fortunately, the tenants were in place and uh, my cash flow kept me going. So the banks didn't force me to sell up. But it really brought home the lessons of cycles, of cash flow management, of financial buffers. It made me a very more cautious investor because of the partnership of four partners who were doing all these developments in the 80s. Two of them went bankrupt because they did other things outside our partnership. So it's uh, made me a much more cautious investor because there but for the grace of God go I. Yeah, it's interesting as they um, mentioned um, earlier on about the, the fear of failure. And I think I'm a much more defensive investor these days. The last few properties we bought have been farmland and bought for cash so very much focused on the return of capital much more so than the returns and people might say look you could get better returns using more leverage and so on which is true but people can become more risk averse as they get older certainly I feel like I am with a family these days and one of the things you find with residential property is that you know we've got super and we've got index funds and some stocks but you almost inevitably end up quite top heavy in property because of the the leverage that you use. Um, so we've sort of tried to diversify into farmland. And in 2017, a few of our loans went across to principal and interest. And we thought, well, let's let's let some of the debt pay down. And that's been good. So what about yourself, Michael? Let's uh, have a look at your portfolio today. Do you invest in other asset classes or are you still mainly in residential property? Do you do any commercial? Are you still mainly focused on Victoria? Um, and well, if so, does that mean you pay a lot of land tax? And are you paying any down or paying any debt down yourself? So I'm going to turn 69 next month. So I'm at a very different stage. So I'd be suggesting to any listeners here, don't compare your chapter 30 with my chapter 69, because things are very different. And I've had the ups and downs. So one of the mistakes I made early in the piece was getting into commercial property too quickly. So I talked about that industrial subdivision, but we can office buildings. We we, we, we did even something in Flinders Lane in, in, in town. I was in the CBD. I was very, very brave. So today my portfolio is much more balanced. So I own heavily weighted to residential, but definitely own commercial, industrial, offices and retail and Melbourne and Brisbane. But over the last maybe 20 years, I've only bought properties to which I could add value and develop. So almost all my portfolio are medium density townhouses, 
or blocks of apartments which I've actually renovated the old uh, apartments. I've got some two beautiful Art Deco apartment blocks that can't be replaced. So very heavily weighted to Melbourne. And yes, I do pay a lot of land tax, uh, but also properties in Brisbane. And for whatever reason, I'll be blunt, I haven't bought anything in Sydney, even though I've looked a number of times, but not not got around to it. But that's where, despite where the Sydney market's going to be, uh, my, my next purchase, but we're currently involved in two developments still uh, and bought two properties this year. So I am slowing down. My loan to value ratios are reducing, uh, but but it's now to the point where it's snowballing. It's just a self-perpetuating cash machine. But boy, Pete, it's had its difficult challenges over the years too. It's just uh, now 50 years, Pete. It's I can't remember if it was 71 or 72 I bought my first property, but after 50 years, I finally got it right. Yeah, it's always uh, interesting. It goes back to that exercise at the wealth retreat with the drawing the graph. There'll, there'll always be ups and downs in the economy, and you have a few personal booms and recessions as well through life. What's the end game for Michael Yardney? Are you going to keep on working until you drop, or are you going to sell down any of the portfolio? Or are you just going to live off the cash flows? Well. I'm no longer investing for me. I'm no longer investing for my kids because all our kids uh, and in my blended family, there are six kids and now 12 grandchildren. Our kids are all living in nice accommodation that they probably couldn't afford on their own. They still pay, they're paying us rent, but then we're making their life a bit easier. I'm paying my grandkids school fees (laughs) and having young kids Pete, you know what that's like. So maybe I won't be able to retire for a while because my youngest grandchild is uh, only three months old and two of my kids still haven't even started having their own children. So I'm talking about intergenerational wealth and I've set it up accordingly. Pam and I contribute a lot to charity. You know we've run a couple of charity balls, but there's all the stuff we do privately that I think part of my responsibility is since I've done well to give back. So we give back to those who are less fortunate and can't be helped. And I like to give back through the daily property update and the uh, the podcast and helping others. So part of what I want to do is make as many Australians financially fluent as possible so that they can enjoy their lives as well. Yes, fantastic. And uh, an interesting journey that we've followed over the years, but uh, the market's been kind to you and you've uh, you've ridden some fantastic booms in Melbourne in particular. And uh, Oh, the market has been kind, but Pete, there's been times when I wasn't sure how we're going to make the bills and pay the bills when we started in business, what's going to happen to the bank's going to ask me to sell something up. So as you say, it is part of the ups and downs of the journey. Yeah, fantastic. So let's um, finish with the property market outlook. So firstly, what do you think will happen next year? We've got an election, immigration coming back on. And then I think more interestingly, what do you think will happen to real estate values over the next, say, 10 years and 20 years? Because I see lots of these opinion pieces. Well, every decade, there's people coming out saying, oh, well, the next decade will be different. And it rarely has been, to be honest. Interest rates have fallen. Prices have just kept on performing. So what do you see next year? But what do you see for the next decade or two decades? Well, if we go back a step, it shows, as you say, property values have kept going up and there's always been naysayers. But one of the drivers of uh, the last decade or so is the continually falling interest rates. That can't happen much anymore. And the other is the strong population growth of Australia. And then the last thing, I guess, was also the wealth of our population. So we're actually wanting to buy in better locations and improve our lot. So we've been very, very lucky. So if one looks forward how that's going to happen, interest rates can't keep falling any further. And we know they're likely to rise eventually, not just around the corner. So that won't be driving the property market. I believe migration will open up. I'm sure that the government realised that we've got to increase our immigration to boost our economy, to provide some of the skilled jobs that are just going to take too long for us to skill up locals uh, to be able to do those. The only way you can improve GDP is, uh, well, there's a number of ways, but the easiest ways is having more people there paying more tax or being more productive. And I'm not sure that we can necessarily be more productive. So the government's going to have to bring more people in. That's going to drive our property markets. But I think at the end of this cycle, we're probably in the well-located suburbs, 
of capital cities will have finished up maybe 25, maybe 30% higher at the end of this cycle. But in the meantime, wages won't have gone up much at all. We know the government would like to, the Reserve Bank would like wages to go up. So I believe that we're going to end up with a two-tier market where some people are going to be able to afford properties and others aren't. Most Aussies won't have more money in their pay packet to be able to pay that extra $500,000 more for a home, which means that uh, some areas are going to languish, but there's always going to be rich people who are going to be able to afford to pay more. So I see slower growth, continual growth, but maybe more divergence between the more affluent suburbs where the rich already own a lot of wealth and where over the next decade there's going to be an even further transfer of wealth. Pete, there's been said, uh, McCrindle, a demographers recently did a study showing baby boomers are expected to pass on a whopping $3.5 trillion to their kids in the next 15 years. That means uh, that a lot of Australians, a quarter of Australians, are going to bank an inheritance that's going to hopefully get them into property as well. So it's a pity because we're losing our middle class, and I don't think that's good for Australia when you look at what's happening overseas with the rich getting richer and a lot of Australians having a little bit more trouble financially, Pete. Yes, I think if you look at Europe, some countries like the United Kingdom, we've got huge inheritance taxes, you know, 40% inheritance tax. Australia just doesn't have that. So all that wealth will get passed down to the next generation as the boomers move on. I think um, on the productivity point, I have a feeling that the next decade or two will be characterised. I think a lot of big tech companies will start to dominate in the knowledge economy and those STEM careers. But they're seemingly very focused at the moment anyway, On certain hubs, it looks like places like Surrey Hills in Sydney and Melbourne around the city, there's a lot of uh, huge activity underway there. And I think there'll be a lot of wealth created very quickly over the next decade. Interesting point on interest rates there, because in the last couple of years, we've seen the introduction of this term funding facility where the banks have been able to tap it at 0.1%. Well, who knows, Mm -hmm. in the next crisis... um, That could even be a negative rate. We've already seen that in Denmark and elsewhere, negative interest rates. So you never really know what's around the corner. And I'd be surprised if interest rates go much higher over the next decade. And finally, um, what do you think about the election this time around? Everyone seems to think in the polls that Labour will get across the line. Do you think um, it might be closer than the polls think? Well, most Australians have got a social conscience, Pete, but I think they tend to vote for their own personal well-being. And probably by the time of the election, which will be in uh, sometime probably between March and May next year, I think the economy will have picked up, jobs will have picked up, uh, what the wealth effect from property is going to feed through where most of Australians are going to feel more financially secure and wealthier, and hopefully COVID's going to be under control. So even though the government's got some legacy issues, they could have done things better with the vaccine and their other issues, people tend not to change government if they're comfortable and if they're financially secure. So while it always seems to be a close election, Scott Morrison looked so good a year ago and, boy, he had his challenges this year, but I think he's probably going to be able to pull it off again. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. And I, I look at what the bookies say and they think that the coalition are marginal favourites despite everything in the polls and Certainly that's been our experience in Europe over the decades is that uh, recessions can see prime ministers chewed up and spat out. But if things are going well, and they certainly have been for household wealth, then um, maybe the incumbents might get voted back in. So uh, I think, um, Michael, it's been brilliant just to tap your brains for half an hour and get a few insights. And I'll give you a plug for free for the wealth retreat event that you run at the Gold Coast, uh, not least because I speak at it myself, but um, as I always say, I would do that course regardless of whether I was a participant speaker because I get so much out of the the networking and the psychology and the mindset side of the week. Uh, but where can people go if they want to find the Michael Yardney podcast and your other content and whatever else it is that you do these days? 
all over the social media, even though recently my Facebook and Instagram got hacked, so I had to start <laughs> all over again. Lost 10,000 Instagram followers, but just look for Michael Yardy. The Michael Yardy podcast, if you like podcasts, listening to Pete's is a, a good way of doing things, and you're often you're regularly on that, Pete. My company, Metropole, helps our clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth by giving strategic, independent advice, and so more than happy to uh, have people look at that as well. Thanks for giving me the opportunity of mentioning it, Pete. Pleasure. Yeah, not too hard to find these days with Google, so I'm sure people will check you out. So uh, thanks again for coming on, and I look forward to catching up in the new year when we can discuss the latest developments as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll be able to make it to Wealth Retreat in April. Who knows what the borders are going to do? Yes, Queensland seems to be a law unto itself at the moment, but if nothing else, I should be able to at least get to Sydney. (laughs) That'd be nice. Cheers. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure. While I enjoyed being interviewed by Pete when we did the original recording, I actually quite enjoyed listening back and hearing our conversation, and I hope you got some insights from it as well. I hope it's also given you the inspiration to take your property investing seriously and take a long-term view because one of the lessons that I've learned over the years, and I didn't know it straight away when I first started, was the importance of just not paying attention to the white noise, all the negative Nellies, all the pessimists, all the worries, all the concerns, because most of the concerns you're going to have today really won't be that relevant in 10, 15 years' time. And on that basis, take a long-term view of your property investing and allow the cycle of the property market leverage time to work in your favour. Of course, one of the lessons I learned over the years that I guess I didn't have a chance to speak with Pete is that not all properties make good investments. There are A-grade properties and investment-grade properties that I would believe you should have in your portfolio. Wealthy people don't buy secondary properties, don't expect to get a top return from a secondary property either. So on that basis, in this stage of the property cycle, you can't just buy any property and hope it's going to do well. And that's why you need independent advice unbiased research. You know how you can make figures and research make say almost anything. Well, at Metropole, my team, start off by working out where you are, where you want to get to, put a strategic plan together for you and explain to you what's realistic, what's doable, what's possible within your circumstances related to your finance, your timeframes, your risk profile, before even talking about a property. So if you're interested in genuinely developing financial freedom through property, you need a plan. Otherwise, you are going to get sidetracked by all that white noise and all the media hype. So my suggestion is have a look at what we do at Metropole. Go to metropole.com.au and you'll find out it all starts by putting a strategic plan together and then you may choose to use our buyers agency services, property management, renovations, division, wealth advisory, financial planning, business accelerator, mastermind. We've got a whole range of services that you may choose to use, some or all of them, to help you grow, protect and pass on your wealth. Go to metropole.com.au. I'd love to be part of your ongoing wealth creation journey. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to teach you about the most important of all the rich habits. Now, you've probably read my book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, I hope you have, that I wrote with Tom Corley. That's become an international bestseller and translated into quite a number of different languages. But Tom did his own five-year rich habits study, and he also studied a lot of research others have done on the habits of successful people. And Tom found that according, well, according to the study conducted by the economists at the University of Padova in Italy, individuals who read for self-education earned 21% more as adults than those who didn't have that growth habit. He also cited another study conducted by Daniel Belsky at Duke University who studied 918 New Zealanders, and he found that individuals who developed the reading-to-learn habit earned more income, had more assets, and had better finances by the age of 38 than their peers. 
Now, as I said, Tom did a five-year study on the daily habits of the rich, and he found that 86% of the rich loved reading, compared to only about a quarter of the poor. Tom found that 63% of the rich listened to audio books during their commute to work, as opposed to 5% of the poor. Now, this study was done a while ago, before podcasts were popular, so I bet you'd be able to swap that over for podcasts nowadays. Tom and his Rich Habits study found that 85% of the rich read two or more self-improvement books every month, compared to 15% of the poor. And Tom also found that 88% of the rich read 30 minutes or more each day. It was a daily habit compared to 2% of the poor. And when you find out what the average person reads, they read for entertainment rather than education. So the conclusion from this is parents who instill in their children the habit of daily educational reading, they then set it up their children to earn more during their lifetimes. This habit it turns out, follows them into their adult lives, even if you, well, you have to instill all these habits as kids. That's where we learn all our habits. Interestingly, a recent study by Brown University, in which nearly 50,000 families were surveyed, concluded that habits of children are unlikely to vary much after the age of nine. So it's not too late for you. You can work on your habits, but if you're a parent or a grandparent, these messages that I give in my mindset message are important, not just for you but for your family as well. You see, most years, in most of the early years for children, they're spent at home, and the bulk of the habits children adopt, such as learning to read, they come primarily from the parents. You are your child's mentor. As infants and toddlers, our brains are hardwired by nature for for, for monkey-see, monkey-do behaviours, thanks to something called mirror neurons. So as a result, children pick up the vast majority of their habits from their parents, good or bad. So you can still develop this most important habit, the habit of reading for education, reading to learn, but why not instill it in your kids as well, if you're at that stage of your life where you've still got kids who are paying attention and listening to you. My kids are all older now, so they don't pay that much attention to me anymore, but I hope I instilled some good habits in them too. I hope you got some benefit from my chat with Pete Borgen or my mindset message. And if you did, and you know somebody else who'd get benefit from it, please tell them about the Michael Yardley podcast and help me in my quest to make as many people financially fluent as possible. Pete's back regularly once a month on the Michael Yardley podcast, doing our regular big picture podcasts. But if you'd like to catch him in between, why not subscribe to download his podcast, The Pete Wardgen Property Pod, wherever you listen to this show. I'll be back again real soon, but you can catch me in the meantime on social media. Just look for Michael Yardney or go to our private Facebook group. Go to the Property Update private Facebook group where I leave a little bit of information about property or the economy every day. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 